Hello and welcome to Politics War Room with James Carville and I'm Al Hunt. We were up all night watching the results come in, some good, some not so good, but we're excited to be here to give you the election breakdown, 2021 insights, and what's going to happen in these crucial next few weeks as you've been waiting uh, to see what, what what's going to occur. Uh, remember, we will take your questions at the end of each episode, so write into politicswarroom at gmail.com or send a tweet to at Politicon for next week's show. We'll get to as many as we can. And this episode is sponsored by Magic Spoon, our favorite cereal. Check out the link in the show notes, and we thank them for their support of the podcast and thank of all of you for listening today. Please tell your friends, remind them to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcast. Hey, James, we got a bunch of good questions again this week. The hardest, uh, the hardest thing here is to choose which ones because they all are so good, and we thank everybody for sending them in. This is a little bit different. This is from Hal, who said that the University of Houston missed games, as did Baylor, and football is important in Texas. Was there any political impact in the election, do you think, from the cancellation of football games in places like Texas and even Wisconsin? Not really. I mean, I, I, I can understand where Hal's coming from, but I, I, I don't think, in, you know, Trump claiming he got the Big Ten back, I, I, I don't think so. Yeah, I, so. I and I, I, and I can't do my own thing because I'm the biggest college football fan in the world, and I don't even care. You know, I'm, I'm just so distracted by what has happened, is happening, and what's going to happen. I, I just would, I thought today I would get my life back. Well, guess what? I didn't. Yeah, someday you will, though. Uh, Carl Maybe. in Walnut Creek, California, asked, "Will there be a role for the center right, never Trumpers?" and helping to heal our country after Trump. You know, I was hopeful. I'm not very hopeful today. I think this is still a Trump party. I don't think he'll win the presidency. I think Biden's going to win. It's going to be ugly and contested and protracted. But he did well enough yesterday. He carried enough people in or helped enough people that this will still be a Trump-dominated party. For those people to have had the kind of influence that I had hoped they would have, he had to suffer really a a huge defeat, a real trouncing. It didn't happen. So I did Rick Wilson, you know, big, big never Trump. I did podcast with him this morning, and he agrees with you. I don't think you're getting any argument from any of the never Trumpers. Uh, yeah. There wasn't yes, a night that they were hoping for. But yeah. they did a hell of a job, and, you know, now they're a permanent part of the Democratic filament here. So then they're talented people, and you just got to gotta sow drone. Yeah. Look, here is a great one, James, and so bear with me. It's going to take a little while, but it's from Julie in Seattle. And she says, I want to share a quick story with you. A few days ago, I was visiting my 86-year-old father, and we were discussing the election as usual. I told him that you're my favorite host. That's you, James. And he said, I met James Carville many years ago, and then proceeded to tell me how my father, John Hinterberger, was the restaurant critic for the Seattle Times. Back in the early 90s, he was part of a roving martini judging panel that took limos from bar to bar judging martinis. My father recognized you in the hotel lobby. She's guessing it was the Mayflower Park where the martini tasting had kicked off. He introduced himself and then invited you to join in on the martini adventure. And guess what happened, James? You accepted. I can only imagine the fun that followed as you traveled around Seattle Tasting martinis. Well, they still I still remember you. I'm sure it's true, but because it was martinis, I don't remember. I probably blacked out, but I love martinis. I'm not. I'm not. I, you know, there's a uh, the, the Duke's Hotel in London is the most famous uh, martini place. That's where Ian Fleming had a martini like every day. And the guy that runs it, he's a Italian guy, and I. I mortified that I can't think of his name because he's just the most charming person uh, that you can imagine. And, and I, when I go to London, I stay at Duke's. I don't, the hotel is just okay. I mean, they're, they're, you know, no one arguing have better hotels in London than Duke's, but, but there's no better bar. And so that just goes to where my priorities are. 
Well, uh, Julie wants you to know that she and her dad still remember you and still uh, talk <laughs> about you. <laughs> Thank God somebody uh, remembers me fondly. <laughs> you know, we have a big Seattle contingent writing in this week. Tom wants to know why Pulsar is considered Pennsylvania and swing state, but not Montana. Uh, according to 538 averages, uh, Biden led Pennsylvania by 4-7 and Trump leads Montana by 4-4. Tom, because Montana ain't a swing state. Uh, you couldn't have had a stronger senatorial candidate than Steve Bullock, very popular governor yesterday. One of the few people who could have been uh, been uh, elected. Maybe John Tester would have been as strong. But it went for Trump, I think, by seven or eight points, less than last time. It's not a purple state. Pennsylvania is a purple state leaning blue, and I think it's going to come out for Biden before this, uh, yeah, before I, this counting is over. I, I, I'm, I'm hearing... Reliably, obviously, it, but Biden may win Pennsylvania by 150,000, 200,000 votes. Uh, but we'll have Paul on the podcast, and he'll definitely be, be really up to date on that. Yeah, uh, this is not a Seattle question, James. Uh, but David's asking if Trump is convicted in New York State Court. I love this question, and goes to prison. Will the Secret Service have to put an agent in prison with him to guard him? as the requirement is to protect former presidents. You know, we've got Cass Sunstrand coming up on the on the podcast. Yeah. And there's not a legal question that Cass can't answer, so we'll, we'll, let's, let's defer it to Cass. He might have the relevant statute off, off the top of his head. <laughs> okay, D- David, stay tuned because um, uh, we'll, uh, we'll try to get an answer for you. And I have a final one here, James. Uh, who pays for the cost of Air Force One uh, when it's on the campaign trail? I know what they're supposed to do, but uh, right. what do you think they do? I think they cheat. Yeah. Why wouldn't they? Yeah. There's nothing else. There. I mean, they charge the government $3 for a glass of water. I, 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 you know, and, and I, you know, you had been sort of like nothing matters. And I said, oh, no way. It's going to add up to 100. The election is going to matter. You know, it really didn't. And, it's a, a, you know, we'll talk about it some more. Joe Biden will win the popular vote, uh, probably. The, the odds are he wins the popular vote by more in the Electoral College by more than George W. Bush won in 2004. Hey, James, Trump is going to lose, but he's never going to go quietly in the night. He will challenge legally everything possible. And this will go on probably for weeks, if not months. And we have the best scholar about these kinds of legal issues and constitutional issues imaginable. Cass Sunstein, Harvard Law Professor, former law clerk to Thurgood Marshall, best-selling author, and who has written about why this is not like Bush v. Gore. Cass Sunstein, uh, just as we went before this election and everybody thought this, this is going to be a rerun of 2016, it wasn't really. Uh, everyone now is saying, my God, there's going to be a recount. The Trump said it's a fraudulent uh, election. They're going to challenge in, in about six or seven states. And everyone says, my God, this is Bush v. Gore all over again. You wrote a really interesting piece uh, the other day on Bloomberg saying this is different than Bush v. Gore. Could you tell us how? Yes. So I think the key thing to keep in mind is that whether something goes to the Supreme Court or is even taken seriously by judges depends on what the specific claim is. And in Bush against Gore, the specific claim was the Florida recount was standardless. And whether or not that's a convincing claim, the idea was that there was one recount team that would count certain votes. There was another recount team that would not count those votes. And that kind of inequality in treatment of voters was a violation of the Equal Protection Clause. I think as of today, no one's arguing that there's a recount procedure done by one state overseer that is standardless. In fact, they couldn't argue that because there isn't a recount procedure starting yet. If it does happen, it better have standards under it. Now, the hanging Chad problem, which some will remember as a kind of nightmare or for a very few dream, that hanging Chad, hanging Chad idea is obsolete because that depended on a technology, a punch card technology, which to my knowledge is no longer in existence. So what kind of recount challenge we have and what kind of challenge we have to anything 
is highly unlikely to be precisely the same as Bush against Gore, and it would indeed be surprising if it was covered by the principle of Bush against Gore. So if Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, where the uh, the uh, uh, Trump people have already uh, filed a suit, I think they filed it uh, actually on Election Day, um, and they're saying, well, Montgomery County is helping voters correct um, their absentee ballots, that doesn't have Bush v. Gore has no application to that kind of question. That's correct. So the court in Bush against Gore, love it or hate it or medium it, was very careful to say we're only talking about one specific thing, that is standardless recount procedures, and added very, you know, explicitly that local districts can have different principles for implementing election laws. And that sentence Really, it had to be there because in the United States, you know, in North Carolina or Virginia, there's going to be one uh, place where the voting process is not the same as in another place. And if you uh, didn't allow that, then you would really be going the way of madness where there would be a constitutional prohibition on any differences. Now, you could imagine in one place, and you don't have to be very imaginative to imagine this, where there's like a really long line, three hours, and another place where there's a really short line, five minutes. Does that violate the Constitution? That would be crazy. You could imagine one place that has one technology and another that has another technology. Does that violate the Constitution? Absolutely not. You can have one place that decides, you know what, we have a defective ballot, and this is what happened in uh, Montgomery County. We have a defective ballot. We're going to allow corrections so that people don't make mistaken votes uh, by their own lights. And another place might say that's kind of resource intensive, and we don't think there's going to be a risk of mistaken votes, so we're not going to allow that correction. Now, those are legitimate calls by people who are balancing different variables differently. And to turn that into a constitutional case, uh, it's not crazy quite, but it's getting there. Well, let me ask you two questions and turn it over to James. One, I, I think the Democrats uh, feel they are much better prepared than they were 20 years ago uh, when they were caught by surprise. They have a bunch of really top-notch lawyers, former uh, solicitor generals working on this. A couple of Republicans I've talked to <clears throat> kind of wink and say, yeah, but we have the Supreme Court. This is a very Republican Supreme Court. So as an analyst, what would be your take on those points? I think having great lawyers isn't good enough if you have a weak argument and you're just wrong. So it's pleasing to hear that, you know, good lawyers are working on things that are important, uh, but good lawyers can't win if your client is clearly guilty. And while we have Supreme Court that's dominated by the Republicans, uh, they aren't going to, you know, make a ruling that is utterly absurd, let's say. Uh, now, I think Bush against Gore was a real stretch. It probably isn't right to say it was utterly absurd, but the, you can't just say Trump and then win before uh, Chief Justice Roberts or even Justice Thomas, who is a very conservative vote. So you've got a voter in his voting patterns, but you've got to say something other than Trump. So we need to see an argument that has uh, precedent and law behind it. And the as of now, we're not seeing that. There's a legitimate argument for a recount in places where the margin is really low. I don't think that would be contested if the law really allows a recount. And then the recount procedure is going to be done pursuant to state law to muster a constitutional claim. Uh, it's doable uh, if you have self-evident favoritism or even you know favoritism that isn't self-evident. That's That's a problem or if you have no standards so that different recount teams are making seat of the pants judgments, that that's a problem. But I don't expect James. to feel that. So, so Cass, let me, I'd be very honest, if you were advising Trump, would you say, so you, you're Trump's lawyer, I know it's an uncomfortable thing, but you are, and he says, God damn it, file something. All right, just don't, just don't sit there. Oh, I, I, if you were a Republican lawyer and you had to pick one place to where you have some chance to do some damage, what would be the lawsuit you would file? As of, that's a great question. Thank you. As of now, there aren't great Republican lawsuits that are really visible. 
So the best, I guess you could say, if you could justify it by reference to facts, is that votes are being counted that aren't real votes or that votes that aren't being counted are real votes. So if you could say that in, you know, uh, uh, Nevada, there are some things that are really fishy that are being counted as pro-Biden votes, but they ain't there, or there are things that aren't being counted that are Trump votes, uh, that's an extremely serious problem. That would be a legitimate claim. If I were working for President Trump, I'd look for something like that, or I'd look for either in the counting or in the recounting, something that shows uh, unequal treatment. And even though Bush against Gore isn't about counting, it's about recounting, there's an an argument that the counting can't be arbitrary. And if you could find that, then then you're in business. As of now, these things are are really challenging to find. So President Biden nominated you to be attorney general, and you're confirmed in Diego Biden, president's office, and he said, Cass, I'll tell you the truth, man, I'm, I'm, I'm... overwhelmed here with stuff I have to do. I want you to handle the Justice Department. For God's sakes, all I want you to do is follow the law wherever that takes you. And then knowing what you know about the Mueller report, knowing the evidence that is in there as it relates to obstruction justice, just the body of knowledge you have now, would you, if you were the Attorney General, consider bringing charges against Trump for obstruction with the evidence that you know is contained in the model. I'd be kind of triply cautious about that, that on the, as attorney general, that the Mueller report gives uh, credible grounds for an obstruction of justice charge. Uh, as a prosecutor, to bring a lawsuit on the basis of credible grounds, uh, bring, bring a criminal charge on the basis of of credible grounds isn't uh, the best thing to, to do. You need a conviction beyond a reasonable doubt, and you you want uh, better than credible grounds. So the Mueller report does provide that. You want to make sure you have much better than that, and the Mueller report does not by itself give you much better than that. Second, I think you, any, I'm sorry. I think any attorney general. I'm not going for time purposes. I'm not going to explain the triple triple caution. I'll explain the double caution. So. Right. To, to bring a criminal charge against a recently defeated uh, uh, opponent in, an, a, in a presidential election is something that you want to be extremely careful about, uh, not because there isn't potential criminal wrongdoing, but because you split the country and you give uh, at least the impression of reprisal against the political enemy. And we've kind of had enough of that the last four years, which is not to say, you know, uh, uh, X next to the question, but which is to say uh, a big yellow sign that could turn red. So I have one final question. Uh, uh, people like me that think that President Obama uh, did, did many good things as president, but one of the things that we'll say is when he, he did not pursue, he and Eric Holder did not pursue criminal charges against some of these bankers. And that cost us a lot of credibility and probably contributed to our defeat in 2016. Do you think that President Obama and Attorney General Holder were insufficiently aggressive in dealing with potential crimes as a result of the housing crisis of 2008? Well, I should say we're talking now about my former boss, as I'm sure you know. I will understand. I know, I know. It's a, I, did, I don't ask it because you see, yeah. <laughs> like a law, you know, I've had law professors at which you want, like, embarrass the shit out of me, so I'll get a chance. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm explaining my own bias here. So, so right. Attorney General Holder, I understand. My colleague and friend. So, uh, I understand. So, discount for what I'm about to say. Uh, Uh, I think Old Testament justice in the midst of a recession is something to be also very careful about, which is to say the first issue in the midst of a recession is to uh, help people hurting. And the second issue in the midst of a recession is to bring the country together for a shared project. And while things weren't as bad then as they are now, they were plenty bad. Uh, To be uh, threatening to put people in jail or putting people in jail um, as a first step, that doesn't help a single person who's losing their house or who's lost their job. It might deter wrongdoing in the future. Uh, so that's 
something. I, I would be very careful about criminal prosecutions, again, unless you had clear grounds. So to say we're going to start prosecuting bankers uh, would be an entry point for a discussion. But the question for the attorney general to ask anyone is, uh, what's the crime they committed? And the fact that things went really bad and that they were engaged in practices that were really bad doesn't get you there. There has to be a violation of the U.S. code. And again, the conviction would have to be beyond a reasonable doubt. And thats I, did, I didn't investigate any of these issues myself. I was involved in another enterprise. But I, 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 I think of the various bad things done by presidents over the last 50 years, the failure to prosecute bankers wouldn't make the top thousand. Okay, well, thank Cash, you, we've Take we've talked about some really uh, the serious, heavy stuff. Before we let you go in about 30 seconds, we had a question from one of our listeners, which we couldn't answer. Uh, and he said, if Trump should be convicted in a state court and he goes to prison, Will the Secret Service have to put an agent in prison with him as required by law? <laughs> You've exceeded my competence. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 uh, I, I think um, uh, let's give a, the, the law professor's favorite answer. Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank, David, you heard that, you. the questioner thing. Cass Sunstein from Harvard Law School, thank you so much. You've really been a a, a marvelous guest. We've learned a lot. Thank you. Great Be pleasure. Safe. Great to talk to my friends. Thank you. And thank best you to your wife. Big Samantha, honor to please. you. Thank you. Okay, thanks both. This episode is brought to you by Magic Spoon. It's a delicious cereal that's keto friendly, gluten free, grain free, soy free, low carb, and GMO free. Best of all, it comes in delicious cocoa, fruity. Frosted or blueberry flavors, which means you can stay healthy and still enjoy your breakfast. Yeah, you know, Al, when you're on a kind of diet that we all own in election time and staying up too late and, you know, probably drinking a little bit more than we need and not eating good, Magic Spoon, it gives some comfort. I, I look at it like, all right, you, you, you've had, you know, four glasses of bourbon and, you know, five bacon strips. So if I have some Magic Spoon, I can get my nutrition back in balance because it it it, it, it uh, to be a frank it's it, it's very 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 tasty and it's very good for you and that's what we need <laughs> and you get rid of your guilt so that's good yeah you know it's yeah. got it's got zero sugar 11 grams of protein and only three net carbs in each serving and and i've talked about my grandchild kai and his favorite he, he now goes back and forth some weeks he'll tell me it's fruity the next week it'll be blueberry and one week it was frosted, so you know he's. I'm. I'm getting his. I'm tallying his votes as we go. Yeah, I'm. 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 I'm I'll lean heavily in the blueberry direction, but uh, you know, Kai's got. He's into choice a little bit more now. We've only got about seventy-five years separating us. Uh, listen, I'll. You know, you go to MagicSpoon.com/slash/warroom to grab a variety pack and try it today, and be sure to use our promo code WARROOM. That's one word at checkout to get free shipping. And Magic Spoon is so confident in this product, it's back with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money. No questions asked. That's magicspoon.com slash warroom and use the code warroom for free shipping. Again, magicspoon.com slash warroom. Use the code warroom and look for the link in our show notes. We thank Magic Spoon for sponsoring this podcast. James, after all the buildup, our first post-election show, there is so much to discuss, and we have a fabulous panel. Paul Begala, uh, who was the better half of the Carville Begala famous duo. Uh, Tara Setmeyer, who is a senior advisor to the Lincoln Project, anti-Trump Republicans. And Jill Abramson, uh, the great former executive editor of the New York Times. Okay, with this great panel, let me start with you, Paul Begala. You wrote a book. It was a wonderful book. We had a 92nd Street uh, discussion about it, The Perfect Guide to Beating Donald Trump. Did the Democrats properly follow your playbook? Ha, yeah, more or less. Joe Biden made it about issues and people. More importantly, it looks like he's going to win back the blue wall. You know, Democrats wanted to expand the field. They may well. It looks like they picked up Arizona. 
But the most important thing was getting back some of those blue collar votes while simultaneously motivating your base. Now, they're very close, but it looks like my own uh, vastly experienced opinion. He's going to win Pennsylvania. He's going to win Wisconsin. He's going to win Michigan. Now, you know, a win's a win's a win. So all in all, yeah, I, I'm not entirely sure any of the other very talented potential nominees that Joe Biden ran against would have done better. Well, I agree with you on that, but I'm not sure he got back those working class voters. When you look at Pennsylvania, Michigan, he carried Oakland County. He seems to have lost Macomb. In Pennsylvania, he's, I think, going to win it, as you said, because he'll do so well in those suburbs, but he's probably going to lose Luzerne County and lose those western counties. So certainly the suburban voters are back, but are the working class Democrats really coming back? Well, that's a good point. It's, there's coming back and coming back. Margins matter. You're seeing a tsunami in the suburbs going to the Democrats. We saw it begin with Hillary. Then we saw Nancy Pelosi's team in 2018 absolutely run up the score. Looks like Biden's done quite well there as well. But you're right. We're not going to win those voters anymore. But margins matter. Right. And and uh, it's still very early. We haven't even counted all the votes. But I do think that uh, Joe has been uh, uh, solicitous and acceptable to those uh, working class whites so as not to get blown out. And that's really all you need anymore. Tara, you are a senior advisor to the Lincoln Project, which engaged in some of the most creative stuff I've seen in politics in a long time, the ads and the assertions. Uh, And the main point is to try to turn the Republican Party back to what you consider its roots. After this election, even though I think he's not going to be president, this is still a Trump party, isn't it? Yeah, unfortunately. Um, But I I would say that those of us at the Lincoln Project we're never under the impression that we would be able to um, repair or or fix the Republican Party per se. Um, We'll leave that to others. Uh, However, we we do see ourselves as a pro-democracy movement. Um, It may not have started out that way. It was, you know, to um, exercise Trumpism and Trump's enablers from the, you know, body politic. And um, given the results you know, we're, it's clear that the role of a group like ours, of a movement like ours, is incredibly important moving forward. Trumpism was not repudiated despite the result, um, which I'm pretty confident that Joe Biden will pull it out. But I'm also very disheartened by how many Americans seem to be okay with someone like Donald Trump, who is such an aberration, who is so incredibly unfit, and dangerous, flat out dangerous to not only our constitutional republic, but to our position in, in the world. That um, the long term repercussions of this, I think, require a a real cultural reckoning in this country. So you know the fact that this country has has been so dismissive of Donald Trump's authoritarian leanings and his lying and the conspiracy theories and you know in bed with our enemies and the corruption. Um, and they're seemingly okay with that. The racism, the misogyny, these are really fundamental problems that we're going to have to face. And um, if we're going to keep this this constitutional republic together, we're going to have to continue to fight um, in a pro-democracy posture. Jill Abramson, uh, I think Tara makes some good points. This was a president who never reached out beyond his base who tried to divide America more than any president, as his former defense chief, James Mattis, uh, said. He lies repeatedly. Uh, The New York Times, I think, has has documented that he is a tax cheat. And he engaged in probably the worst domestic mismanagement of a crisis, COVID-19, perhaps in the history of the country. And he still came close. I mean, this was really, I think, in that sense, a disappointing night. He should have lost by double digits. And it was close. Yeah. And I, I basically agree with what you said. And I think the results, you know, and I'm not taking them for granted at this point, uh, certainly don't show a repudiation of Trumpism. Uh, and I think again, uh, a, a large portion of, of the news media, which is, you know, what I continue to keep my closest eye on, you know, really did participate in a kind of 
you know, my, my, my friend John Ellis, uh, called it overism that, you know, the, the uh, large portions of the news media and many columnists, you know, again, led their listeners and readers to expect sort of this blue wave and a very commanding Biden victory. And, and that surely hasn't happened. And, you know, when we talk about the need for a, a kind of national reckoning whenever this is settled, I think once again, you know, the, the large news organizations in this country show a fundamental out of touchness with the part of the United States which views Donald Trump as their leader. And that is a really big problem. James. So, Paul, uh, you, you remember 2004 election quite well, don't you? And I think President Bush was reelected with 286 electoral votes and something like a margin of 2.4 in the, in the popular vote. It's almost certain that Biden will approach 5% in the popular vote when it's, when it's all scattered out. And right now, it, it's probable that he will get at least 286, maybe 307, would, would, would the odds are. So explain to me and everybody on this show why I felt like shit after the morning <laughs> of the 2004 election, and I still feel like shit after the morning of the 2020 election. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the answer, I think, is, is a combination of the comments that Tara and Jill just gave us, right? First, Trump is, in my eyes and yours, in the eyes of the majority of Americans, a uniquely odious figure and a unique and existential threat to democracy. And so we believe that all good people should reject him. And then we can fight over taxes and spending and all the things that Republicans and Democrats used to fight about. Uh, that's Tara's, I think, very excellent point. And to Jill's point that we misled ourselves, but willfully, uh, and, and I think earnestly, uh, into thinking that everybody was, was just like us. I, I will note that the Democrats have this capacity for self-flagellation that is utterly lacking in Trump land. Um, I, I, I'll note that at Trumpism, I think everybody's right that Trumpism is a continuing threat. I will note that pretty weak Republicans ran ahead of Trump in almost every contested Senate election. Uh, Susan Collins exceeded Trump by 15 points in Maine. John Cornyn, exceeded Trump by five points in Texas. David Perdue exceeded Trump by three points in Georgia. Uh, John James in Michigan, losing, exceeded Trump by two points. Cory Gardner, losing, exceeded Trump by four points. The only major race I saw where Trump exceeded the Republican Senate candidate was in South Carolina, where Lindsey Graham won anyway, but it's South Carolina. Trump only exceeded Graham by 2%. This is as of uh, Tuesday night late. It, it may change as the final results come in. I guess my point is, uh, a win is a win is a win. Trump is a unique threat. We should feel very good. In the last century, we've only fired four presidents, and one of them, Gerald Ford, never got elected in the first place. So we've really only fired three elected presidents in a century. Uh, we're also following, for the first time in American history, three two-term presidencies in a row. Not the first, the second time. Jefferson, Madison, Monroe each had eight full years. But since then, we haven't had that. And now we have with Bush Wait, with Clinton, Bush, and Obama. So we've been actually on a roll of stability in the White House. We've been reelecting our presidents pretty comfortably. So actually, I think what looks like, I, I'm actually very confident Biden pulls it off when all the votes are counted. So it looks like actually Biden has pulled off a hell of a win in a very uh, difficult climate against an almost impossibly uh, uh, challenging foe because he's un, unrestricted by any kind of moral guardrails. So I, actually, I feel pretty good the more I look at it. So Tara... <laughs> You're a lifelong Republican until Trump, and you, many of your friends. I did Rick Wilson's podcast this morning with Molly Jones Pass. And right now, if if you a the poster would call you and said, "Do you consider yourself a Republican Democrat or what?" What would you answer? I'm an or what. Um, you know, I I've been trying to hold on, hoping that there would be some semblance of of sanity 
after this election where those of us who still believe in traditional establishment Republican conservative principles would play a role in rebuilding the party after it had burned to the ground. Um, It's clear to me that the party at this point is unsalvageable moving forward, given how many people were willing to vote for Donald Trump and how many of his enablers were rewarded with um, re-election. So at this point, um, I think it would be fair to say that uh, I can no longer, in good conscience, call myself a Republican. And uh, that makes news here on your podcast because I have never really publicly disowned the Republican Party until now. And so, you know, it's uh, it's incredibly disheartening. But I'll tell you this. Um, I- I'll be, you know, I love you guys, you know, my Democratic brethren that we've, we were fighting on the same side for for our republic. But I'm just not a Democrat when it comes to, you know, worldview. So which is, you know, that's fine. Um, and now uh, I'll be unaffiliated or an independent. Uh, I live in Virginia, so it doesn't really matter as far as elections are concerned. Um, but I-, I have to I have to say, and Paul Begala, you know that I love you. And uh, you and and James Carville have been um, nemesis of mine when I was in college at GW, and you know the story. <laughs> and I never thought if you would have asked 20-year-old Tara in 1996 if she would ever be sharing a, a podcast stage with Carville and Bogala 20 years later on the same side of things, um, I would have told you you were crazy. But I respect, I respect you, James Carville, for ha- your bare-knuckle, straightforward candor on what Democrats need to do and how they message it. And I was fearful through this campaign that the Biden campaign was entirely too passive. They allowed Trump to get away with the propaganda and defining him uh, erroneously. And they just were not enough on the offense. I use prevent defense as an analogy all the time about the way that the Biden campaign was going after things. And prevent defense doesn't prevent anything but a win. Now, he may squeak it out, right? But I just feel like it was a missed opportunity to define Trump for the degenerate that he is and how dangerous and how how much he was costing this country and individuals that they just did not, they didn't do it. And I just don't know why. So if you're presented with the option of voting for a congressional Senate candidate, and one is a Republican and, you know, their, 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 their deportment is fine, that they wear a nice suit, they take a good shower, <laughs> They're married, okay? But it's, look, the president's the leader of, of the Republican Party, and I feel like a, is, a, is a Republican I, I, I bound in, in most cases to support the president. There's a Democrat who's kind of disheveled and uh, maybe not culturally in, you know, he's not the she, or prob- probably a she, and I, he is, is a pretty liberal Democrat. And you're voting in the general election. Which one do you vote for? I think it would depend. If they were a, a Mitt Romney type of Republican, then yeah, I'll vote the I'll both vote for the well, Republican. Candidate. Look, I'm, 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 a, I'm, a, I'm a clean, freshen up Republican, but I believe that Donald Trump is the leader of the party, and I, I have to give deference to no. his opinions. No, I've already down ballot voted blue since 2018 okay. for the first time in my adult right. life. So I've I've already made that departure okay. strictly off of anyone so, who supports Donald Trump or enables him is unfit for office, in my opinion. So, uh, Jill, uh, it. As you know, because we talk a lot, uh, I'm partly what you would consider a, a, a New York Times sycophant. However, it, it strikes me they did some really breathtaking uh, allocation of resources, stories uh, that brought yeah. a lot about Donald Trump to light. And you can't help but look back on this. You know, if you're sitting in the newsroom this morning and, and there's these people that went through the tax returns and went through like everything you can imagine. And, and you just, are you beating your head against the wall saying, what was it all for? Yeah. Um, well, you know, I, I hope they're not all beating their heads against the wall today because it, it was, you know, the, the best investigative reporting I've ever seen, and especially the work over a matter of years on, on Trump taxes. But the, the, the fault is, you know, the, the media, news media landscape that this country has right now is exactly as polarized as the country itself. And the people that needed to see that great investigative journalism from the Times 
they're not reading the New York Times. They're getting most of their news from still from their Facebook news feed. And the almighty algorithm uh, shows all of Red America who gets their news that way, the news that they like and the news they agree with. And that isn't the information in the New York Times. And it isn't, you know, specific to the Times. It, it's true of, you know, MSNBC and CNN, which also speak only, let's face it, to the already converted. And, you know, who do we, we blame for, for this? That really, in many ways, is big tech. It's the big tech platforms and the algorithms which feed people what they already think they know and agree with, even if it's the most vile conspiracy story, you know, theories that all of us can agree are poison injected in, into the veins of, of the public. And you know, I, I I wish I knew how to how to turn that around because I think it has to be turned around before you know anything can be fixed because reliable, truthful information is the 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 soul of our democracy. It just is, and now we have. The, a public which receives news and information as two separate realities, just as the results of this election have turned out. And, you know, I'm desperately fearful of it. In some ways, I think Donald Trump, if he loses by a hair and, you know, is ultimately turned away by the courts, a, an aggrieved Donald Trump with this, you know, army of followers is is a horrible thing to contemplate for the next four years or or even beyond. And without the Senate, I just, you know, I think it, it it's the, the country is still riven and divided the way it was before election day. Paul Begala, uh, I don't want to get in the way of your your jubilation today because I'm really happy whenever you're happy. And I certainly <laughs> agree with you that the single most important, without any really close second, was the election of the president of the United States, and that's going to be Biden. If it had gone the other way, we all would have been uh, uh, taking Prozac or whatever you take when you're depressed. However, let me just point out and get you to react that that. The United, the Republicans in the Senate cheated on the Supreme Court nominations. They cheated on it. They wouldn't even consider Merrick Garland. They rushed through Judge Barrett in a matter of a couple of weeks, and they got away with it. They were rewarded for it. Lindsey Graham despicably sold out his mentor, John McCain, and he got away with it. And Joe Biden, thank God he's going to be president, but he's going to want to do something about covid Mitch McConnell, no way. Check. He's going to want to expand the public option. No way. Check. He's going to want to take up climate change. Not Mitch McConnell. He's going to want to do something for child care. Not under Mitch McConnell. That's not a very optimistic outlook. And? So why are you so happy, Paul? <laughs> because on January 20th, it looks entirely likely that Donald J. Trump will be a private citizen. Well, I'm happy that about that the too. Most, yeah. But that's just not something to be happy about. No. It's the most important thing on earth. I guess I'm trying on to look earth. ahead and saying, talk, I mean, also what matters oh, after gruesome. getting We're rid of 1850. him, but matters the, is the, governing. The, and, and, and I am so happy that Joe Biden will be the person who will have to govern, but I am so upset about the difficult task with Mitch McConnell leading the Senate. Absolutely. The, the divisions that, 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 Joe was talking about are real. They're deep. They're reflected in our media, but they are also real in our life. And those will continue. They are even deeper, even more passionate than I believed 48 hours ago. This is real. We may be in the 1850s. We have nearly irreconcilable views about what America is. 
this is really bad. It's really frustrating. It's going to be very difficult, boarding on impossible to get anything done. All that's true. On top of that, we have a, a Senate that is so stacked toward smaller and usually more conservative states that it's very difficult for the majority to rule the country anymore. We have a Supreme Court, the majority of which have now been placed there by presidents who initially took office without popular support and then confirmed by senators who do not represent a majority of Americans. So that's a great point. There are crises of legitimacy in the Senate, in the Supreme Court, in our ability to tackle uh, common problems for the common good. And yet, Donald Trump's finger will no longer be on the nuclear button with 6,000 thermonuclear warheads. Donald Trump will no longer be sitting atop uh, an armed forces of 1.3 million people or a civilian workforce of many millions more or a budget of trillions of dollars. That was the existential threat. All those other threats are real. They will plague us the rest of our lives. And I, I fear that we're entering into a very, very difficult period. But we're going to enter it without Trump in the White House. And that is the most important thing. I, I mean it. I think this was existential. I think people uh, like Jill's colleagues in the media have been largely heroic. I think uh, Tara's colleagues in the Lincoln Project have been uh, heroic. And, and in that sense, the good guys and gals have won. The country has, for the first time in 28 years, fired an incumbent president, looks like it. And I, I'm quite certain they will. So I, that's why I feel good. All the, Everything you say is right. And yet we got rid of Trump. Tara, but, but, but I'll get you to respond to this and maybe Joe and Paul. The, the way I look at this election is, is I have a massively infected wisdom tooth and I have <laughs> arthritis. OK, so I go and I get the wisdom tooth out. I still got arthritis, but the goddamn wisdom tooth is gone. Yeah. Okay. But you, no, you have a. And, you, you let me correct that. You have a tumor the size of a medicine ball okay. in your throat. <laughs> oh, okay, and it's metastasizing. Right, but it meta <laughs> but here's the thing, Paul and James. You, if we use the tumor um, analogy, you remove the tumor, but how much of it metastasized to other places? And now we have to, you know, address the other areas of the body that have been, um, you know, corrupted Very by important. this malignancy. Right. So, um, I, I mean. Paul, I love you and you make me um, happy sometimes with your optimism on things. And you know that I'm just naturally a bit more skeptical. I'm with James Carville on this. Yeah, we the wisdom tooth is pulled out. You're right. Donald Trump is out of the White House. He can't control the Justice Department anymore. He can't, you know, corrupt the Pentagon and our generals and all the, the, the things that he's done that are uh, completely out of bounds and um, unhinged in this country. Um, however... What is left behind is still concerning, and I think that that, that cannot be overlooked. It just can't, and that's why well, um, the fight continues. I don't like Darth Riders, totally but I'm sure I'm glad the wisdom tooth is gone. Right, because <laughs> <laughs> then you can keep talking at least, right? <laughs> yeah. I think it's just a, a malignancy to, to torture the analogy <laughs> still exists in our system because what's unlike 2000 is as awful as, you know, the 30 something days were and as awful as that Supreme court decision was, I don't think the country was left with 50% half the country believing that George W. Bush was a completely illegitimate president. And I think Trump's hideous abilities as a demagogue will, you know, be echoing that Joe Biden is the illegitimate president for, you know, years and years. And, you know, a large part of the, the country is going to you know, view the, this president as a corrupt president when he's the furthest thing from it. But that is just, you know, I'll take the victory, but, you know, th this aftertaste is going to be beyond bitter and corrosive and, and a very negative long-term effect on the fabric of our democracy. I, I, Excuse me, Tara, I understand that you have a real hard out. We really appreciate your time. Uh, thank you so much, and I hope we can have you back and discuss these things with you in the future. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Anytime. All right.
Well, James, you always want to, um, you get impatient with me because you think I epitomize the Democrats penchant for seeing the glass half empty. That would be correct. And <laughs> it, in this case, I, you know, I don't see it as half empty, but I, you know, I, 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 I see the immediate future as very very worrisome i i just do and i i think i'm I, unfortunately going to be proven right i mean we where's haven't your glass yeah if they're going to be you know trump supporters and right-wing extremists in the street yet we just we don't know but Right. You know, I don't put it past him to, you know, call out the Proud Boys. It, it's going to be ugly. I think I think that's right, Jill. But again, he, he was calling them out and, and he may yet in the last months of his presidency, if in fact Biden is declared the winner, which I think he will be. Um, but when he he'll and he'll likely develop some powerful media platform. You're right. Um, but it's still not the presidency. I went to Charlottesville the day after Heather Heyer was murdered by a white supremacist. And it was one of the most heartbreaking days of my life. And to hear, to be there in that town and, and watching people weeping in public and hugging each other, strangers, and then to have my president and theirs and Heather's president say those things, it is different. And, and it's, it, we have these divisions, you're right, they're going to continue. But so my glass is, you know, three fourths full. And I think that that's a, a, a better way to look at this. All those things you say are true. They're absolutely true. But I'd rather have him <laughs> outside the tent pissing in. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, uh, uh, in this sense, because he's not got the powers. He is. You, you're watching, and, and your paper has covered this. He is has slowly, because thank God he's incompetent, slowly corrupted so many of the levers of government. He hadn't gotten all of them. But God forbid he gets another four years. I think he will. So uh, to me, it's an existential thing. Everything you say is right. But at least the immediate and existential threat looks like it is being removed. Mm -hmm. well, my glass is two thirds full. <laughs> Albert. It's me. Okay. 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 Yeah, but can I make one, yeah, sure. one yeah, last but point? Everybody, James, make, Jill, make a point here because we, we can edit it. So well, just say which, anything. Go ahead. We, we, this is part of what frustrates me, and I suspect it does you, James, and Jill, and everybody. We are in a period. If, if, if you're just a political scientist, you came over here from France or Mars or whatever, you would say this is a period of remarkable democratic dominance in the United States of America. No party in all of American history, since parties were formed in 1828, has ever won seven out of eight popular votes of the presidential election. Never. Now they have, and it's the Democrats. And it, it frustrates me no end that for that, we get, uh, we hope finally the White House, but we, we, we have lost the, vet, the majority of the Supreme Court, we've lost the Senate, um, and it, that's got to rankle people. The thing I'm most worried about is young people. They, they responded to the financial crisis by many of them, a great many of them, losing faith in capitalism. They responded to crises in like my holy mother church and other places by losing their religion. Uh, and I think that's a shame. They responded to the crisis of democracy by turning to more democracy in the most patriotic way that they could. And God, that gives me hope. It gives me faith. And if they are denied again, after winning seven out of eight, they denied the White House, looks like they denied the Senate. Um, uh, then they're going to lose hope in everything. So I, I do think it's terribly, terribly important, especially for young people who busted their tails and who have believed in this system to be able to uh, stand there on, on the mall or watch on television and watch Donald Trump be e evicted and Joe Biden inaugurated. So, so Joe, but, I pray yeah. that that is what happens. Uh, and Paul, do we know yet whether the rates of voting all went up very dramatically. I haven't seen enough data, Jill, but anecdotally, yes. But I just haven't seen it yeah. enough data. So, well, what happened, uh, get both of y'all's reaction, is what happened to the Latinx vote? And I'm not just talking about Miami-Dade. I think it was disappointing 
turn out in the, the Rio Grande Valley. Uh, but yeah. we'd had a probably when we look at it, it'll be a little bit disappointing in Nevada. That it seems clear that Biden is going to win it. The margin was a lot, you know, shorter than we hoped for. Uh, I would it, but just speculate. What the hell happened? Is, there? Th- th- we we got to we got to have real people look at this. Great journalists, but also I think we need some investigators and lawyers, James. Uh, I, I have spoken innumerable times in the last 24 hours to the ace political consultant or not consultant, political worker in Texas who you've had on this podcast, Billy Begala. Yes. Billy pointed, but my, my son, Jill, who's just a flipping uh-huh. genius. Billy pointed me last night uh, to the Rio Grande Valley where we've spent a ton of time. I've spent countless hours and days down there. Two counties in that valley went for Trump. This is the most democratic region in Texas. Right. And and Zapata County, which is a mid-sized county, went for Trump. It went for Hillary by like 30 points. And it flipped. Kennedy County, where there's only about 200 people, where I, that's where I deer hunt. <laughs> literally. No, there's literally fewer than 200 voters in Kennedy County, Texas. So it's kind of hard to glean much from that flipping. But throughout the valley, not only was turnout down because they're getting slammed by COVID, but Trump's performance was up and way up. And nobody has offered a plausible theory as to why. I understand Miami data, I really do. And I respect Cuban Americans and Venezuelan Americans who fled Castro and Chavez and Maduro being really worried about socialism. I respect that and I get that. And I I think there's things that, that Democrats should have done to counter that. I understand that and I think it's real. I don't have any legitimate plausible explanation yet as to why Tejanos in the Valley, the most Democratic people in Texas turned toward Trump. I saw something well, that Paul, Star County. Oh, you got to get the Texas Tribune and ProPublica on that. It's I'm like sure they a will be. Yeah, fantastic investigative Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. project. Absolutely. Paul, have you looked at Arizona? Not, not closely. Tell you the truth, because I wonder if it's different there and it's different among. De- I don't know the answer to this. I'm. I was stunned by uh, both both Texas and, and I, I was even stunned by Florida. I don't know about Nevada, but I, but I just wonder if they're, you know, we, we don't view the Latino vote as a homogeneous vote and it's different in different places and why that's the case. And I, I don't, I'm asking, well, but I, I, know. I know this, I, 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 of course the, the, the Latinx vote is really a, a complex and, and multifaceted all the way from Europeans from Spain to uh, Afro-Caribbeans. But in, in Texas, the folks I know and in the Valley are almost all Mexican-Americans. And I think that's very much the same in Arizona, Nevada, California. I do know this, though. That's, that spans a lot of distance, right, from, from Texas to California. And that's how wide Mexico is. And if you come from the interior of Mexico and you move up to Texas, you're probably a more conservative Mexicano than if you come from the coast and you move, just like a, a white guy in Houston is more conservative than a white guy in LA. So I get that, but I still haven't seen any explanation for this collapse in the Rio Grande Valley. It, it just mystifies me. I saw it in Star County. I, I just remember saying, wow, that can't be true. You know, Star County, my, one of my college roommates was from there. It was at the time, probably still is the very poorest county in America. Um, and, and, and almost a hundred percent Mexican American. If, if they, if, if Trump is doing better there, I, I, it's lost on me. I don't understand why. And I would like, I think Jill's right. Get some good journalists to dig into that. And Evan Smith at Texas Tribune uh, is like the perfect, perfect person to take that on. Yeah. Well, Paul, they, I mean, that was part of the reason that Texas was so disappointing. But when, when, last night over you know, one or two o'clock this morning, the v- margins weren't as big as some people were hoping for or predicting. And, and uh, certainly in Harris or Dallas County either. Yeah, we're just going to have to plow through all the chicken and trails. And the, I mean, it, I, I, I was wrong. Let me say, I called Texas for the Democrats. I believed if you went from 8.7 million votes to 11 or 12 or 12 and a half, now it does look like the final counts closer to 11 than 12 and a half. But I just felt like if you boosted turnout that much, I, I, my argument was you know pretty simple. I'm a simple person. If high turnout benefited the Republicans running a one party state for 25 years, Texas would have already been a high turnout state. So, you know, ipso facto, high turnout must be good for Democrats. I was just wrong. And I want to know why. I just don't know. I assume Democrats did not uh, win the state house. That's correct. And they did not perform well in the congressional races either. And of course, MJ Hagar 
who to me was like the model of the kind of Texan who can win uh, for the Democrats lost as well. Yeah. James, a final word. No, I mean, uh, it was a great show. I, I, I think it was therapeutic for me. I, I, I hope it's therapeutic for, for our, our listeners. Uh, you know, I, I'd like hope that I said to myself yesterday, I cannot go another goddamn day. I've just had it. And it looks like I'm going to have to just go on because we're going to have some critical races coming up in Georgia. And all I can say is let's soldier on people. And, you know, we're not at least, you know, our lives are not going to have to look at him every day. And for uh, another 77 you know, it, days, we will. Yeah, well, that's okay. I can, I got to look forward to something. Right? You're right. I'm sorry. Just, I, I just got to look forward to something. I, I, I just refuse. I just refuse to give in. Hey, Paul, Tara, and Joe Abramson, you have elevated us. Thanks so much for joining us. Hey, thanks for listening to Politics War Room with James Carville, and I'm Al Hunt. Remember, email your questions to politicswarroom at gmail.com or tweet them for next week's show at Politicon. Thanks for subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. Please rate the show with a five-star review. We'll be back next week as this saga of 2020 continues. <laughs>